Hello, everyone, and welcome to June 6th, the Legislative Committee meeting of the Town of Vegreville. Call this meeting to order at uh, 301. I'll be looking for a motion to adopt the agenda. Councilor Bullock makes the motion. Is there any additions or deletions? None. All those in favor? Carry. Next up, the adoption of the minutes of our last regular ledge meeting. Councillor Lamco makes that motion. Any errors or admissions, omissions within those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor. <coughs> okay, well, first of all, let me start by welcoming back Councillor Rudick. Councillor Rudick had a 20 day, 28 day absence. How long were you gone? Four months, yes. Well, we're very happy to have you back. And I uh, see you've been working right away. I've been hearing you on radio and you're back in the community. So thank you very much. And, uh, we're looking for a real busy summer here, so. Okay, so first up, we have Kaylee, your MCO. Hello, our HR you were sure. resource officer. Yeah. So I'm not sure, has everyone had time to read over um, my memo and the proposed changes? Um, are you prepared to go through them today, or how in depth do we want to get? Well, is anybody else? Uh, go ahead, Councillor Bullock. It said in here that you're going to be looking to take it to legal counsel to have yes. it over, and I think that'd be a wise idea from what I read <laughs> from here. So okay. I think there's some points in there that they're going to actually question. So, okay. yes, uh, yeah. So legal counsel, once it goes there, then I think bring it back to us at that point. Okay. So is there any input or anything you'd like to see out of the document before bringing it to legal, so we don't have to go back and forth? Uh, CAO letter. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Just to, to circle back on that, Councillor Bullock, our hope was to, to bring it forward to you guys to get any input and then sort of to go to, to council with a with a vetted document in case it was something you guys wanted to see changed in, in you know, what we've proposed, and then we can just bring it to uh, to legal counsel to vet and then they, you know, give us an input on all of it, so. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so no. I don't know what some of the legalities are going to be in there. A question I have about uh, safety sensitive positions. I think m most positions are safety sensitive, not even the ones that are on equipment because supervisors can actually send people into a situation. If they're green, they don't even know what they m might be doing. So if they're set up, you know, to go in to do something and if they're not right, to me, that's a safety sensitive position too. So just things like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So basically, there is limitations on what, as an organization, uh, an employer, uh, what we are allowed and not allowed to do yes. through legislation. So basically, once you have this vetted through our lawyer, uh, I would imagine that any incidents, we have the ability to test at the time of an incident or after, legally correct. We believe so. The post-incident or near-miss testing is, is for safety-sensitive positions, so not administrative positions. Okay. So, with uh, the rest of the uh, policy, is there any other 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 than uh, the safety position, or the, is there any other questions anybody else has of this policy? Okay. So then. So we'll Something I did want to bring up through my research, and I just wanted your opinions on it. Of course, legal will have the final say, but about pre-employment testing for safety-sensitive positions, is that something the town wants to head in a direction of doing? Um, I know through my research, larger facilities do this, um, smaller municipalities not so much, and I think that might have to do with the fee because, of course, if we were to do this, I'd get someone like a Can-Am or Dyna-Life would have to have a start a relationship with to do that sort of testing, which is possible, I'm just not sure of what the costs incurred would be. Can you give me an example of uh, a position that we would require? A so like an, an operator, so someone okay. who's operating the heavy equipment, um, you know, a pre-screen or part of their onboarding process would be you have to pass a drug and alcohol test to get onto our site, something like that. Any thoughts? Uh, I do have a question. Yeah. You've identified that it would be pre-employment. So yes. those employees that are currently employed, you would not be able to, I'm certain, I'm yeah. a lawyer again, but yeah. I'm pretty certain you cannot go back and begin a process. No, for, no. For so everyone already or employed would be, so to speak, grandfathered into that. It'd just be starting, and then if there was a near-miss or accident incident, that kind of thing, then it would be required. 
I guess I would be curious about a parallel example. You know, in most safety sensitive positions, if you're working in industry, the employer pays for those testing. Yes. Um, that's pretty standard. Yeah. Um, and I think that would probably be the expectation of people, particularly if we're having people that would be working in public works that would be potentially working in other indus industries. They would be familiar with the process yeah. and they would also be familiar with the potential employer paying for that. So I would imagine for us, we wouldn't be hiring that many, so the no. potential cost would be fairly limited. Yes. But it would probably be prudent for us to know that because it's not inexpensive. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that would be part of the consideration. Um, I think it's probably wise given the scope of work that our staff do and, and just some of the projects that are happening right now. You know, I think that's probably something that we need to have in place and probably should have before. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Bullock. Yeah, one more thing. So there's nothing unusual that in the oil field practices. Every oil field company works this pre-employment pre testing. They also do test their contractors. So I think it would something I would like to see probably going towards the contractors too. Yeah, I think, I'm sorry, I'm sure that in our policy it does state um, anyone that is under contract with us, um, they would fall under our uh, policy for drug and alcohol. They'd follow that unless their policy was more strict than ours. So I mean, they would go. So on a Saturday, if somebody was a future employee here was uh, was drinking on a Saturday and we tested them on a Monday, they could not get maybe not have that position because there was alcohol in their system. Well, they would know ahead of time. So if I were to make an offer of employment, be like pending condition, you pass, you know, your drug and alcohol test. We'll book it. Here's the date. So they'll have the date ahead of time to know. But we wouldn't require that same test for somebody that will be doing uh, office duties. No. So the way we would manage that, if we su suspected someone, you know, is maybe the under the influence of something, it would be from a manager perspective, like, are you fit for duty? Do you need to go see a doctor and get a medical note that you're fit to duty, fit for duty to be employed here, and then go that route? We still manage it, just not with a test. Okay, is anybody opposed? Oh, go, go ahead, Councilor. Yeah, I, yeah, I oppose that because you can have somebody that's an administrative position going on a work site. You know, work sites anywhere in town, so you have equipment going around for that. So that's where I'm at at that. This is no different than oil field. All management positions get tested. They do. So I don't see why that should be any different anywhere else. So because if you're going to end up going on a work site, you have just got to talk to an employee over nothing to do with what they're actually doing, with whether it's uh, HR thing for now, you're going to be on a work site. Unless I guess, of course, if you're coming into an office, but there are going to be those instances, so I think it needs to be, uh, you know, organization-wide. So, yeah, so, so if we want a zero tolerance, that's something we can definitely talk to our legal team about, how we'd go about addressing those concerns. Councillor Rama. I'm good. I just turned on my mic so that I can see everything. <laughs> Well, myself personally, I mean, I, if we make it for one position, we make it for all. I mean, the <laughs> fact that we have the ability during an incident or something that happens that we have the ability to test then, I mean, that's important. Um, I don't know, like, cannabis is legal, alcohol is legal. I, I really, I guess what you're looking for is somebody that's doing some sort of illegal drug, but which would... Go ahead, Councillor Wilbur. Sorry, and just to clarify, and again, I'm not an expert, but in my experience in industry too, um, it doesn't matter if it's legal. It's a matter of whether or not you're fit for duty and yes. the, the potential for us as a large employer to have somebody on site that could potentially put other people in danger is is the the reason why why industry does this. So it's not a matter of endorsing or choosing what is safe to consume. It's a matter of providing safety to our staff, period. And some of, the, some of the projects that we're undertaking right now, um, it, you don't need to look too far down the road to be able to see that there's a lot of stuff happening and absolutely our staff are expert at what they do, but we wanna make sure that we continue to be an employer of choice, which means that we should follow industry standards. So it's, it's not about legality, it's about safety. Okay, so we're not gonna test anybody that's in our organization now, but we're only gonna test certain positions before they're hired. Is that really what you'd like to see in the policy? 
Yes, because right now it's with human rights, the Human Rights Act and the Human Rights Commission. It's a gray area, of which I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer, surprise. <laughs> but I'd like to get it vetted just to make sure we don't infringe on any of those rights. Um, right now, it's safety-sensitive positions because you have to prove it's a bona fide occupational requirement of that position that they can't consume any sort of illegal substance, alcohol, that kind of thing. You have to be fit Before for duty. Before we hire them. Yes. Mm-hmm. But we won't be testing them after they're hired. Well, w- if an incident or something occurs. An incident. <laughs> Post-incident. Officer Barry. Yeah, thank you, Worship. I don't have a real problem with anything I see here. It's, it's so long as I know that it is basically sort of like an industrial municipal standard and it's gone through legal review. Yes. Then I don't have a real problem with the uh, pre-employment testing because at least that gives you uh, the evidence that when the person was brought on staff, you didn't you recognized that they didn't have a problem, an alcohol or a drug problem. Um, but certainly, if somebody is present at their job, no matter what the job is, <coughs> and they don't appear to be fit for duty, mm-hmm. then we should be able to have some route to question them. Yes, uh, not just to have it go on and go on that somebody is not fit for duty. And uh, employees that are suffering from a a substance abuse problem, it is recognized as a disability um, and it's protected ground. So they do have a a responsibility. They don't have to, but they should, you know, let their employer be aware of that um, when being hired. Of course, they don't have to, but they do have uh, a responsibility as well to work safe on the job site, as well as the employer to provide a safe environment. Okay. so. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Bowie. I do believe when you send when you send a legal counsel, you're probably going to find out something about. Uh, I do believe about pre-employment testing. That's going to be an issue. I think a previous career that I was in, I was involved heavily in the safety end of it. Oh, okay. And so I think you're going to run into that problem. I think. Yeah. Unless it's changed. Well, we'll get you'll vet it through them. Oh, absolutely. Come back and uh, give us yeah. an update, uh, Councillor Blanco. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good idea to go down this road. Uh, We want to ensure that employees that are working for us are actually fit for work. Uh, One of the uh, uh, things that may trigger uh, an employee, not only as an incident, but a a change in typical character of that employee over time. It's something that uh, employees could tell, something's up with Gerald, Uh, he's just not himself. Uh, lately and, and stuff like that. So I know when I, uh, my previous employer, that was one of the triggers that would warrant the possibility of of uh, going for some testing. And that might be through, are you fit for work and yeah. through a doctor, that kind of, it doesn't have to be drug testing, yeah. but it needs to be, hey, you, you may need to uh, go and get a fit I'm for I'm glad work. you mentioned that because that is something I was looking to as well as uh, creating an impairment policy. So not impairment, so to speak, just for specifically for drugs and alcohol, but stress, um, you know, if you're tired, are you fit for duty? You know, if you've been out all night doing some kind of shift, are you expected to be back the next morning? So really ensuring our employees and staff fit to be doing the job. And, and that might be from an emotional point too, like, uh, uh, you know, a mental breakdown or, or something that's going on in that individual's life that may not be fit for work. And a policy like this could trigger that to z- get the help that we need so you're not the stigma of being uh, losing your job over something that uh, you have no control over and sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Would we consider, like, uh, a lifeguard a say safety-sensitive position? I would think so, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's my question. Okay, well, we yeah. look forward to uh, your next report and uh, continuing the conversation. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank okay. you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, oh sorry, <laughs> Councillor Warwick. Uh, sorry, you know what? I will turn the camera off afterwards. I realize it's easier for me to come on. I just had one question uh, for you guys for when you are looking out, I agree with all the direction we're going in. So my only question would be is if we're putting these safeguards in place where we're asking the questions of someone's fit, I just want to know or want us to find out what the legalities are, what kind of what it opens up for us, I guess, is my mm-hmm. concern. Like, it's fine we're saying we're going to have a process to decide if someone's fit for work, but then does that, if we have this process, 
um, does it open us up potentially to other legal problems where they're saying you should have known they weren't fit or so I just want us to make sure that we aren't setting it up in a way and then who are we putting this responsibility and onus on to make those calls so I'm not against it in any way I just want to make sure that we aren't in some way setting ourselves up for a, a bigger issue okay okay taking notes I take it I did take notes I figured <laughs> okay so yeah so we look forward to that thank you all thank you next up uh, director Lefebvre Thank you, Worship. <coughs> we have a, <coughs> excuse me, a memo to council regarding a proposed crosswalk. Uh, the background is at the April 18th, 2023 legislative committee meeting, council reviewed correspondence from two residents requesting a crosswalk to be installed on 44A Street and 57A Avenue. Council directed IP and D to contact the two residents that would be impacted by the crosswalk installation and prepare cost options. Letters were sent out to the owners of 5721 44A Street and also to 5710 44A Street, informing them of the proposal and instructing them to provide their feedback by May 11th, 2023. The IPND department did not receive any feedback and what was prepared below is the costs for different versions of the crosswalk as we discussed at the April 18th meeting. So option one is the concrete ramp or a para ramp where there is no concrete as if you look at the diagram you can see where I've placed it in as an eight meter in black so that would be proposed location uh, the crosswalk signs there's a cost for them the sign installation labor uh, and the crosswalk painting which is when the units out doing others and just swings in to do this one so it wouldn't be that big of a cost so the option one total is three thousand one hundred eighty five dollars Option two is to do crosswalk painting and signage, but no concrete sidewalk. So unfortunately that would have you steering people from a sidewalk across the street onto grass, which isn't so bad in the summer, but in the winter they're going into a snowbank. So that doesn't work well, but that is an option. On the last page, uh, second last page council, the options are option one council approves option one in the amount of $3,185 to be paid for this year, 2023. Option two is council approves option two in the amount of $625 to be paid for this year. Uh, option three is council chooses an option to be presented in the 2024 budget or council decides not to install the proposed crosswalk. And you can see on the diagram on the last page that we were proposing an eight meter curve of a para ramp. This would allow for the crosswalk to cross from sidewalk to sidewalk and give residents using the new para ramp, the ability to walk towards 57A Ave, towards where it says eight meters, until they're safely at the intersection and then onto the road like they're doing now. Any comments, uh, start us up, Councillor Barry. Thank you, Worship. Um, so without the sidewalk or bit of pavement there, what is gonna be this is beat up grass that uh, is in front of the in individual who owns that sign. So that's the one disadvantage of not having the ability for them to come up onto a sidewalk. Um, it's just unfortunate that the way the area is designed is that once they go around the corner, they still have to be walking on the roadway because there are no sidewalks in that area. Right, and it's it's not uncommon in the area the neighborhood was built when it's a cul-de-sac because yes. the cul-de-sac by nature is obviously traffic slowing and calming, so there's not a lot of speed. So it was then accepted acceptable to have no sidewalks. But it would be kind of it would probably be beat up quite a bit on on what we would be expecting that individual to care for because it is grass in front of his place up to the roadway. Uh, uh, Councillor Barry, right now, uh, the kids and, and most people just walk on the on the pavement to the corner, and they they go across there now. They don't actually walk on this lawn. I mean, right now, this it, it's just a relief when they get across. There will be something to steer you to the the cul-de-sac, and then they'll be back on the road. It's a little bit of maintenance for that owner there. They'll have to shovel that, but. Um, you know, like uh, 
Director Lefebvre says back in the day when this subdivision was proposed in cul-de-sacs, there was an, there was an expectation to put in sidewalks. But it is very tricky, you know, for the, the, the children that live in this cul-de-sac to come out and get to the sidewalk, that's for sure. So I think we've all okayed, uh, you know, that we felt good about putting a crosswalk in. It's just are we going to go that extra mile and put that little, that little piece of sidewalk in. Go ahead, Councillor Bullock. I'm thinking we should put the piece of sidewalk in because if we're going to be waiting for traffic, I would rather have the kids waiting on the sidewalk area than waiting on the street. That's where I'm at with that. So option one is the only logical one to me. <coughs> okay, well, there's no other comments. We'll bring this up at uh, Monday's council meeting for a decision. Okay. Thank you. So then... Are we leaning towards a recommendation so I can do this is a this is the memo to council with your options the recommendation will come at the regular council meeting with a recommendation okay we can do a little straw vote right, right now uh, council Lamco what are your thoughts option one your worship okay. yeah I'd go option one because I think if we're going to do it we should do it now uh, I think you've got the majority, yep. Councilor sure. Royal. Okay. Yep. Okay, so yeah, that should be the recommendation, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, and Council realizes this is not a budgeted item, so something else will ha not have to happen, so this can happen. And we all miss one payday. <laughs> 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 okay, you guys, pretty serious around here. <laughs> We're doing something good here. Something else is going to have to suffer, but whatever. They don't, oh, sorry, Director Lefebvre will find some money in some other project. We know it. <laughs> Good luck. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's already gone. It's busted up. <laughs> I just never say anything about it. Okay, thank you very much. Next up is Director Saskew, but we have an intern, interim director. <laughs> Go ahead, Bryce. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so this memorandum is for the land sale policy and procedure. Um, the proposal is to approve the updates to the land sale policy and procedure listed below. The background is that the sale of town owned land policy and procedure are up for review as per the CAO's foundational documents listing. Minor changes have been made to the policy to update titles from town manager to CAO. The following changes below have been made to the procedure. Um, do you want them all read out? Uh, no, I think everybody's read them, right? I mean, is it? So, so there's three supporting documents also that you guys will see on Allnet. Um, document two being the town policy, document three being the town procedure, and document four being the proposed request for council decision that um, will appear at the council meeting. And so the options provided are that town council approve the land sale policy and procedure as presented at the next council meeting or that town council request additional revisions to the land sale policy and procedures to, pre to be presented at the next council meeting. Okay. Is there any comments right now? Uh, go ahead, Councillor Bullock. On uh, the, uh, sorry, procedure two and three there, they same dates so there's no new dates on these drafts that's from the old so yep. they're showing the revision dates may 8th so the new it's going to have a new revision date on there somewhere yeah you can update that okay oh sorry go ahead Councilor. Uh, Councilor. It, it appears one's a policy and one's a procedure There's three yeah. different documents. Yeah, difference between the documents. The policy is technically the public facing document. The procedure is more the behind the scenes document governing how staff will apply a council's policy. Okay, so there's no other questions. We'll see this at Monday's council meeting. Um, perfect. Thank you very much. <coughs> Next up, CAO Leggett. Add nothing for that uh, section of the agenda, Your Worship. Uh, 
Okay, so it's me. Uh, Royal Canadian Legion, Branch 39, has uh, sent us a, a letter regarding the VMIR. And uh, we are hereby applying for an exemption from fees to bring our recyclables, materials, toner, cartridges, batteries, fluorescent tubes, light bulbs to the <coughs> above noted town facility. The Royal, uh, Royal Canadian Legion is a not for profit organization supporting veterans and offering events to the vulnerable and area and the citizens. So. I'm not sure that we offer everything that they're asking for for a nonprofit. The toners, batteries, all that. Oh, Councillor Barry. Thank you, Your Worship. I, that was probably what I was looking at is the aspect that in the past we have had a couple of special projects brought to us where all the lighting fixtures were changed and they wanted to just get a reduction or a fee exemption for disposing of the bulbs. My concern here, this is kind of an all-encompassing, anything we take to the VMER if we don't get a fee charge as a non, not-for-profit, and I'm looking at how many not-for-profits do we have in the town. This could set a precedent that um, we have to basically be changing a policy that non-profits wouldn't be charged for anything they do at VMER, and what would that cost us actually is, is one of the concerns I'd have. Okay, so let's go, okay. So yeah, you thank, you, thank you, Worship, and, and I echo Councillor Barry's comments. We shared those concerns around the SMT meeting there that the, the previous ones seemed to be those organizations coming in saying, we're changing all the fluorescent light bulbs to this, can you give us that one-time exemption? We were also somewhat concerned of sort of the slippery slope effect of, of continuing to grant, you know, exemptions for everything. Um, also on the, along that vein, some of this stuff isn't expensive either, right? So for an organization to come in, whoever they are, to to you know bring a light bulb is like a dollar so you know the cost benefit ratio is is not there but you know i think it it, it brings up that question that do we do we shift the policy now and sort of make it blanket wide every time one toner cartridge expires that that you know that organization can bring it in for free or, or are we really just considering those one time things where somebody's making a big change that might have a couple of hundred bucks attached to it dr lefebvre Yes, Your Worship. What is our normal practice at the facility, at the VMER? Well, the toners, batteries, fluorescent bulbs are a chargeable item unless you're a resident. If it comes out of your home, then there isn't a charge for the fluorescent bulbs. And I did check with Phyllis, our lead hand at the VMER, and she has let me know that over years, there's the Legion has brought in some sporadic shredding once in a while. And as far as she knows, as far as the bulb stoners and batteries, they haven't they haven't brought in that we're aware of. If they have, it's been very very light. So we also confirmed with the Legion, and yes, their intent is that they want this to be an open an open window that it come any time, not just a one time. We've got our lights changed. We have 50 of them. You know, get rid of them for free. This is something they want to have as ongoing. So right now, if you're a resident. Paying property taxes in Vegreville. You can bring your toner there and drop it off. No charge. That's my understanding is the toner. I know the batteries. And batteries and like uh, lithium batteries for tools because I talked to Phyllis today and she said I could just drop them off of the Beamer yeah. and there's no charge to a resident of the town of Vegreville. But a business there is. And how do we determine who's going to be a nonprofit and so... Again, I, I just think that we just open ourselves up to, a, you know, to everybody's just showing up. Oh yeah, I brought this on behalf of, you know, the the Boy Scouts, you know, like uh, twenty two toners that I had in my basement. So we'll see this on Monday, and uh, maybe we should uh, end up having some sort of policy ar around this when it comes, you know, because we we've helped organizations valid comes to mind recently uh, I know that uh, there's been other nonprofits that have asked us on their fluorescent tubes they want to do the right thing and again there's no charge to residents but businesses because of the volume and stuff that so maybe we should look at a, a policy on how we 
are accepting things and they're, uh, you know, I, I don't want to put a bunch of work on, on, on the admin, but I mean, once if it was spelled out pretty, you know, clearly with, you know, we're nonprofits set with this, if it was a special project, uh, you know, you know, putting in more, uh, efficient lighting or something like that, that we, we could help out by taking the bulbs in like we've done in the past at no charge. I'm just not sure where where this goes. I mean, like, uh, go ahead, CEO, you like it. I think to that end, Your Worship, I'd, I'd almost argue there is a policy in place right now because we've got the pricing model, you know, that that's set, those costs are known and all of that, and we're seeing one-off e exceptions. So, you know, it, if, if we change the policy to then open it up to the whole not-for-profit sector or something like that, we could definitely come up with some rules or guidelines that, you know, if somebody was making that application, they had to come in with their, you know, society number to, to prove that fact or something along those lines. But, but yet, as it is right now, yeah, we've definitely, we've got a policy for the, the pricing and it's set. And so the pricing you know, maybe is we for just entertain those one-off requests. Non-res, and is there a pricing portion of that policy that says for non-profits? So we'll start uh, with Councillor Bullock and we'll go to Councillor Barrett. Well, yeah, maybe we should look at the policy for that fact. I mean, if we don't have one telling of what we're doing with nonprofits there. Another thing I think of also don't want stuff going to the landfill and getting put in there anyway. So I think we better look a little deeper into it at this point. Recycling is important and it's a concern. So I guess we better look at it and make a decision because right now I don't think I could even make a decision today. Okay, Councillor Barrett. Yeah, that was partially what I was going to ask is the aspect of we want to encourage the recycling of most of those types of items, the batteries, the cartridges, the bulbs. And so that's that's the flip side of, well, we open it up so that all the nonprofits can do it, but if we can encourage them to recycle, it's, I think we need to weigh this out and figure out <coughs> Well, we got to remember too what they're asking here are pieces that we accept, but they don't generate any money. That they cost money. Exactly. So I mean, we you know when it comes to cardboard and uh, other materials that there is not even co cost recovery in, but there is some method of recovering some money. You know, I mean again, how many? Different religious organization in town or nonprofits, and well, they have a you know a printer, a cartridge collection <laughs> at their facility, and because the, you know, I don't know if everybody knows what it costs us to run that recycling center every year, but it's a ton of money, and without no help from any other partner in helping with the cost, I mean, maybe we, myself personally. I think that one-on-one -on -one projects that where they're moving to more energy efficient lighting, that we can see that. But when we get into this non, uh, opening it up to, to non-profits and where do we end? So we will, this will come back on Monday. Is there any more information anybody wants? Is it going to chase, or take a look at right now that the policy states residential is free and everything else pays. Oh, go ahead. I think it might be worthwhile <coughs> just to, for, to confirm for everybody, and I'm directing this towards Dale, uh, Director Lefebvre. Um, most toner cartridges are, the cost is assumed by the manufacturer, not by the municipality. Is that not true? That is not true. Not, mu not anymore? The, um, Hewlett Packard was one that was doing it, <coughs> and there's companies now that are charging, and I'm just reading the solid fees. Uh, and I, for yeah, so the pr the printer cartridges f it says non residential. There's a charge. Um, the fluorescent bulbs, if you're if it's a resident, there's no charge. And household batteries like double A's, triple A's, D's is three dollars and sixty three cents a kilogram. And that's even if you're a resident. That's not it's not separating the two. So if you oh. have to package those up, you take every single battery and and tape the ends up so they can't touch and then they put them in the containers that we have to ship them to to Eastern Canada to be processed. So it costs money to do that. Okay, Councillor Warba. 
I, I think my point is similar similar as to what some others have just said, but it's just uh, I, I want to be able to help but encourage people to be using the program because we don't want things to end up in our landfill. But I do have a little bit of concern that even when we say our residents don't pay, but they ultimately pay because it's tax dollars that run the facility. So our residents are still paying in some way. So I just want to be really diligent that we aren't opening up a can of worms that, you know, they're paying even more. And um, unfortunately, it it's a little bit hard once you allow for one and not the other. So my tendency happens to be that if we want to encourage groups to do um, greener, cleaner type of uh, projects, I would be more inclined to, in that case, take it on a one-time basis versus just blanketly opening it. But I look forward to just any information that comes on that. So. Okay. Well, we'll see this yes or no on Monday. Okay. Thank you, me. Okay, so next up is round table. It was quick. So let's move right away to Councillor Warwa, who's down in Ottawa right now, is joining us on some sort of teleconferencing <laughs> thing. Well, it's not bad. It, it, it's, um, it's a little different than our days of Zoom because I did realize it's best to shut the camera off in between just so that you know when I'm coming on, but it's working. Is um, it smoky in Ottawa? Is it which? Smoky. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I seen the fires burning across the river the other night. It was... Yeah. So I landed um, about, uh, it was about 2 a.m. on Monday morning, and at that point, you couldn't smell anything. We had already heard some of the uh, evacuation orders that were going in areas, but uh, today when you stepped out of the buildings, um, it's very smoky. You can smell it. In fact, you can smell it coming into the buildings. So it's pretty hard here right now. Anyone who has breathing issues. So I always think of our first responders. It's uh, pretty brutal to think what they go through right there because it's, it's pretty bad for anyone that has asthma or anything right now. Yeah, it, it, it all happened in a hurry there across the river in Quebec. It's crazy. Well. Yeah. So other than that, yes, I am here this week, but um, I didn't have a lot from residents, actually more so just excitement um, about a lot of the summer events. That's mainly what people were contacting me about. Um, and there is a lot of people asking about uh, our involvement with the Pesica Festival, which I know we don't specifically run, but that did bring me to a question. I didn't have any other complaints from residents, but I did wonder, um, do we have any other additional roles that we as a town are having to do other than maybe volunteering with some of the events, but is there anything else that's falling on us for that festival? Because that's all I got. No, I don't believe so. The opening ceremonies, of course, uh, a couple of words from the mayor, and they usually have a uh, luncheon upstairs. I do believe that uh, Councillor Lemko will be working on behalf of the, the uh, Vegalo and Area Stands with Ukraine Committee. We'll have a booth there. And I see they're looking for a few volunteers for that as well at that Pasanka base. So anybody okay. out there that can, reach out uh, through... Uh, through Councillor Lemko, I guess, or Cindy Bidella, or yeah, certainly, uh, Your Worship, uh, it's the information booth, uh, and, and it'll also encompass the Vegarbon area stands with Ukraine. Some information on that. So uh, they're looking for people to fill in some slots, four hours uh, at a time, to uh, assist the, uh, the people who are coming to the community and with information they may need to uh, to gather uh, about the community, but also about the festival itself. So if you're interested, you know, get a hold of myself or uh, reach out to Sydney Bidella and she'll uh, certainly be glad to put you uh, down on the spot. Okay, so why don't you give us your round table report? Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, not hearing a lot in the community of people coming to me. There's the odd uh, thing uh, uh, about uh, what's going on in town with all the amount of traffic and people and what's happening with uh, Prosperity Park and uh, and those things and it just the same. Uh, it's an exciting time to be. I had a question regarding our action um, for healthy communities and our presenter Lisa was she able to uh, get uh, some assistance with uh, finding uh, uh, an office or something that we had asked her. 
Go ahead, say yeah, thank you, Worship, and uh, through to Councillor Lemko. Yeah, the um, last piece of correspondence I saw, and that was our FCSS manager was uh, had had a meeting lined up, uh, and they were going to propose four possible locations. One of those being ours here, so it's being worked on. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Uh, also, uh, just a question around uh, uh, the derelict properties. Are we uh, making some headway there with uh, some of the facilities? I know. Uh, uh, one is uh, becoming uh, quite an eyesore in the community with the amount of grass and dandelions and growth around the facility and the, uh, the boarded up windows and, and stuff like that. It's looking, uh, people are asking a little bit about what, when, what's the s status of that and, and others as well. So to, to comment on that, generally um, the, the uh, social media campaigns gone out, I think I emailed you guys um, what a lot of those those deals. So thanks to, to Jameson and that department for getting that out there. Um, we're working on multiple files on that front right now. The property you're referring to, we're actually uh, handing that one over to legal because of some intricacies with that property owner. Um, they've already been engaged and that process is underway as well. Yeah, and uh, one more item uh, for those people who aren't aware, the. Uh, uh, Pump Track Park at Foxview is quite busy with uh, numerous children uh, attempting their uh, abilities on, on the park. It's nice to see, um, you know, youngsters as little as seven, uh, seven years old up on the top of the big hill um, and most of them taking the chicken's choice route uh, back out. But uh, it's nice to hear the laughter and see the bicycle. So come out. Bring your bike and, uh, and get out there and uh, give it a, a, a boo. It's a nice welcome addition in our community. And the best part of it, it's free. Thank you very much. Councillor Rudick. Well, I may have been on leave, but I've been talking to a lot of people. So I've been uh, hearing a lot of things. <laughs> Lots of excitement um, and questions about what we're doing in town. So. Uh, I think people forget like the construction projects, what exactly we're repairing and why we're doing it. So um, again, that's always a nice thing for us to be able to share with the public what it is that we're doing, what we decided as council during budget talks uh, and what they're seeing on the streets. Cause I think there's an assumption on our part potentially at this table that we've had those discussions, but the public certainly isn't paying attention until it's right in front of them. Um, Cause a lot of them are not watching us in our meetings and, and we don't necessarily have that reporting um, continuity um, with them. So I guess it was just a reminder to me that people are wondering what is being repaired, what we're doing. Um, Prosperity Park is easy to see. There's lots of things going on there. Um, but needless to say, that is definitely coffee talk for a lot of folks. They want to see what's going on, but they're also curious about, you know, we're doing um, sidewalks and we're doing roads. Um, had a few questions about um, tax bills again. So that query continues on. Um, and I guess it would be, this is for you, CAO Leggett, uh, about just again, the confirmation that if people are not equipped to be online, that they still have the ability to get their tax bills by coming to the office and receiving those. Because um, there is still confusion or concern from some um, that that isn't the case. and. Uh, just to clarify that they can call in or present themselves to the office and receive their tax bill and be able to remit in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, anybody that's not registered for the online still had their, their tax notice were mailed to them. Yeah, there's a, a bit of concern that they're feeling um, that they weren't adequately notified. Um, whether that's accurate or not, that's definitely the, the feeling of some seniors that um, have been doing the same pr process for many years. Uh, and then the last thing is about uh, municipal enforcement. I know that there's been a push to be able to elevate what we're expecting from residents and, and businesses locally. And I've heard the talk of the town on Monday and um, the increased uh, awareness for the public. But some of our previous challenges um, continue to be challenges. Uh, and so I've had some questions asked about industrial properties that continue to be unsightly properties. And these are residents that have repeatedly uh, raised concerns. Mm -hmm. They're both visible from the highway as well as uh, from their homes. And um, 
there are many residents that would not be allowed or permitted to have that kind of um, perpetual bad behavior. Um, and a lot of it's been permitted in perpetuity. So um, we'll talk off camera, but there are some that continue to be concerns and they have been for many years while I've been on council. So I'm excited to see that the community standards are going to be applied to all that are in violation. Um, and that means that so many people take good care of their yards and we wanna make sure that everybody's having that same care and attention. Um, and that's it. I think we all need to recognize uh, basically if the business owner or the resident wants to make it difficult, no matter what our bylaws say or what the Municipal Government Act says that we're allowed to do, it is a big chore to try to force somebody into being a good citizen. And without putting a monetary punishment behind it, they just sort of string us along, I, and I want everybody that, uh, that's out there listening right now, is that you may think we're doing nothing, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes and working with these people, and I think we're getting a lot better at it, and moving forward, we will know a little bit more about the type of approach we need to take consistently, and not just, well, I talk to them, and you know, I'll talk to them again in three months, that the, that the first, point of contact, they better understand how serious we are about this, and the next time that we talk to them, if there was a promise made and it wasn't fulfilled, the fine should start. And they should be going, increasing every time. So it is tough, and I know a lot of citizens get upset and think we're doing nothing, but believe me, it, it is a hard road to hoe because of our legal situation and what we are allowed to do and the fact that you, it's hard to make somebody a good citizen, to force them to be a good citizen, so. Okay, next up, Councillor Barry. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, some of the same questions, just some general inquiries uh, of what's going on around town. But I always find it amusing. I've spent some time out of town, and uh, I have people who I know in other communities that are asking some of the same questions, you know, as to, what's going with all that dirt moving around out there and what are you doing and, and actually um, getting a lot of comments that, uh, as I have said before, that uh, people in other communities are looking at Beggarville as uh, moving and they see things happening and I think that's uh, very positive. Um, I'm sort of still trying to recover because uh, I spent the weekend in Camrose at the Camrose soccer Midnight Madness or whatever they call it, and we ended up with our U19 girls uh, playing two of their games at 1.30 in the morning followed with 10 o'clock in the morning. So four hours of sleep, this isn't enough for me. But I will, <laughs> I will say <laughs> those, um, those kids, they survive it. Um, they ended up meddling, and actually four out of the seven teams that went down from Vegreville got medals, so uh, I think they're, the soccer can be pretty proud. And I also just want to throw out the, some of the kids in town that actually made it to provincials for track and field. Uh, I think it's quite an accomplishment to even make it to the provincials. And uh, actually some of them, yes, they couldn't finish first or second or third against some of these powerhouses, other schools around the province, but they had a really big experience and my daughter, I'm very proud, was one of them. So um, kudos out to those kids that work their butts off to make it to provincials. Okay, thank you very much. Comes a bullock. Thank you. So actually for me, actually one of the things that came up with actually just this morning, a resident had come to me about uh, asphalt falling apart on, the, on 54th Avenue between 46th Street and 45th Street. And I, I advise them how to submit a request on that. So uh, there should be a request submitted just for some information of what's going out there. I don't know what it looks like myself there, but he's saying that some of the pavement has been actually whatever it wore away at this point, and they either park in the hole or they kind of park on the street. So 
I don't know. So, but anyways, there should be <coughs> e service requests coming through that for some information. Uh, another thing that uh, came up um, that had mentioned to me about uh, out of town lawn businesses in town. So, I don't know nothing about that, but have, have they got their permits kind of thing? It came from another lawn business. So, that's local. So, uh, there's that. And then Sunday, looking forward to uh, being part of the. Uh, Legion Decoration Day, so anybody who gets a chance out to support the Legion, it's a one o'clock at the uh, cemetery. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Just uh, in conversation with Councillor Bullock, when you get those calls, it's really good if the local business contacts our office, because now I don't know what the company name is, I don't know anything, so if they call us, for sure we'll check into it and we'll go visit them if they're in town. He didn't tell me what they were, so. Yeah, I get a lot of calls about a, a lot of stuff, and I, you know, I tried to tell them that this is your first step, and if you don't get anywhere, then you could call me back, but please take this step first, because, I mean, this is what our organization does, and they're set up that way. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Councillor Barry for doing the grad uh, at St. Mary's for me. I uh, left town early that night. He did the, the remarks to the, the graduates. It was my pleasure, actually. <laughs> and the following evening, Councillor Curtis did the, the call. So I heard back from the teachers and uh, from the staff that everything was very nice. So I want to thank you both. And uh, Councillor Bullock for stepping up on Sunday and taking, because we were leaving town again. We weren't going to, but taking on deco decoration, decoration Day. I appreciate it. And uh, it's... It's a very nice thing the Legion does out there, and not just in Beggarville, but this whole surrounding area. So I've had a lot of calls regarding bylaw and stuff, and, and I've told, I've talked earlier uh, after Council Rudick brought up, and I just want people to understand that we are trying. Uh, I've had a few calls and a very persistent uh, resident of town regarding our new credit card policy when it comes to paying taxes and uh, that we are somehow working behind uh, a cloak, that uh, we are being sneaky about this and everything, and uh, I want every citizen of this town to know that nobody should have to help, help pay your share of taxes. And I've been very open about this for 10 years on this council, that it is a very dumb practice to lose money when we're supposed to collect 100% of pr uh, property taxes, and now that we're moving forward with it, it was discussion that was held in a policy change. And it is not fair to expect us to cater to a few that want to get a few air miles or a few points. Meanwhile, the rest of the residents of this town have to share on their tax bill. So anybody that wants to phone me regarding this topic, just that's listening out there today, and I know one person is, just keep that in mind, is that w this community is not going to be paying a portion of your taxes. You're responsible for 100% of them. So, that being said, I'm done. <laughs> now we'll move on to director's highlights. Director Lafayette. Thank you, Worship. I want to start with the... Uh the formal full throttle property and the uh, pension who has completed their phase two ESA environmental site assessment. Um, we have the report now completed. Um, it's approximately, well, there's two sites, one of about 700 meters square and the, the south site of about 400 meters square will require um, to be excavated and, and taken to our landfill where we are um, licensed by province to treat hydrocarbon contaminated soils. We are ready to go to tender now probably the end of this week so we can get some pricing. I, I call it tender, it could be a request proposal, whatever we're gonna do, if we're gonna get a, a number that's much more solid, but we'll get a pre-tender estimate probably this week. And that'll give us a good idea. That's encompassing the fact that we've got the material to bring in. We've also got uh, a place to take those contaminated soils very close and we can treat it on site um, with our own equipment. I'm waiting for things like, do we require a liner on the north and west face? Do we require all that stuff that we're, we're just fine tuning right now? So 
Um, this has realistically happened very quick from a call to them to work while they're still doing a cleanup on site with the insurance company to us. So I'm, I'm quite pleased with Finchin and, and the speed that we're getting out of this. So we should have an answer by our next meeting. We'll have, have some numbers. So that's, that's good. Uh, I did talk with uh, Colville Construction. They are heading out in the near future when they're finished a sewer project that we're working on with the town and they will be doing the cleanup of the first half meter, 0.5 of a meter of that full throttle site. And that gets trucked and hauled out to a, a containment treatment facility um, out by the city and not at our landfill, which is fine by me because it's a, a different type of contamination, right? It's not just mom and pa gas station stuff. So there's a difference. Uh, the force main was out to tender as of Monday of this week. Uh, so that was good to see. It was it was a large project. It's it's a force main directional drill from here to the lagoon with bypass pumping capability along the way. It's a complete re-chamber and re-valve and reflow of the lagoon cell. There's another 15 units out there to do plus the main chamber. This also includes a revamp of the sewer lift station internal components of valves and programming. Uh, the, the building, as we all know, has been approved and we're, we're good to go, but it is it is of age, to say the least, and it's time to, to bring it back up to 2023, so we're good for another, if we're lucky, it'd be another almost 40 years out of it again. So so that's uh, out there now. It's on bids and tenders. It's also in Alberta Purchase and Connection sites, and the close date will be on the 20th of this month, so we got two weeks to put it together. What we're doing now is we're where we have the ability through ENC, our testing company that we've had for some time, they're gonna go out and uh, drill about four, four or five sample areas along where we need to do the, the directional drilling. Um, some of the people that are bidding on this or asking for that information, we don't always provide it. And we decided the cost, which is very minimal to get this done, we provide that. And then it helps them provide a more accurate tender if they know that you know, things are consistent between here and there. If not, you know, they'll put in an amount just in case they hit something that's a, that's difficult. So by spending, it's, it's seriously, it's a couple thousand dollars to get the drilling done because there's no reporting or, or engineered, you have to do this or this. We just want a sample and what is it? And we send it out. So now the tender's out, but we have time because it'll be done by the end of this week. We throw that in as an addendum to the tender process so they get the information that they're requiring instead of waiting another week for tender because we don't want to wait at all anymore. This is, uh, this, is what, this is where we're at. And as Councillor Rudick uh, alluded to that, uh, yes, we have manholes and sewer line repairs and things popping all over town. They do go out in the town's website as uh, road closures for construction. We've been sending it out that way. The local residents are affected or also old school informed by <coughs> what you can put on your door. Bless you. Uh, so yeah, we've got manholes, sewer line repairs, sanitary sewer service main line repairs. We've completed a couple of those already. Um, we are now the CCs we found that weren't working throughout the winter, but we're not leaking. We're uh, doing those now. Service connections from homes that were hanging in for the winter now that were thawed out, we're onto those. So the list is quite lengthy. And we've got another road reconstruction that was down for about a week to do some concrete work is now back active and that's by the, um, the John Deere dealer on 53rd. So that sat for a week so we could repair catch basin, let the concrete tighten up. And now the contractor's back in to, to wrap that up. So, so it's, uh, as far as IP and deeds, it's it's busy. It's it's that time of year for us, and and uh, public works and municipal services and utilities and everybody's is just humming right now. So it's our go time is right now. Good. Any questions? Go ahead, Councilor Bullock. Unrelated to what you were talking to, but uh, one of the repairs down Fifty Third Street going towards Foxview and stuff, it did bring a question to me, and I forgot to relay it to you. They were concerned about. The, the infrastructure going that way, you know, down that road, if something were to happen, how would they get out? But I said, I, I don't know what about the infrastructure underneath, what shape it's in right now, but I just kind of, do we know at this You're point? talking about road base? Yeah, underneath and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, we're keeping an eye on it. This is, it's, it's not industrial development. They're not bringing in, you know, things that weigh hundreds of tons. So the road is the roads were designed at the time to handle that type of load, and I, I do travel them. I'm not seeing 
movement or anything at this point. The actual Fox View uh, phase phase one, part one of phase one, is only got its 50 mil lift on the asphalt, and we leave that for a reason so that when we're done constructing the use, when the, when, the, when the development is developed, then we come back, we repair any soft spots that may have showed up, and then we put another 50 mils for our total of 100 mils or four inches of, of asphalt. And that's when we finish the roads. And I know I get some residents that are billionaire getting upset because there's water ponding in front of their street when it rains. And, and that's just, you're gonna have to let it wait till it evaporate. When we finish the last lift, that will all be corrected and, and straightened out, so. Thanks. Yeah. So, Director Lefebvre, could you give us a little update on the paving project at uh, Pasanka Park? I know that uh, up to the VIC has been included in this year's budget. How long is your department going to wait for the answer back on the grant funding before that project gets started? I was actually hoping Councillor Rawa could help us with that. She had requested some information last meeting and we sent it off to see if she could get some information that we couldn't get. So, but I don't know how she's made well, up. Oh, she's there. back. Yeah. Yeah, so after you sent it, I did put in the formal request and I got an acknowledgement of the request and someone will be following up with me, which they have not yet. But uh, we did put in it again Monday because we hadn't heard back, but I got acknowledgement of our request. So usually I hear back within a few days. So hopefully before the week's out. Well, I'll threaten them with a public inquiry and see what they say. <laughs> I'll tell them the mayor's coming down. <laughs> okay. It'll be very public. So is there a timeline on how long your department will wait before that project goes ahead? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm going to give it, I need to find out more information if, if we're in the running, if we're not, if we're close, if we're out in left field, it's what I need. I'm trying to figure out something because once we start constructing, then we don't qualify anymore, right? Once we start doing things. So we're better off to just wait. We'll throw some, unfortunately, some pothole patch material down here and there, but we just need so much more than that. And uh, my order of counsel says pull the trigger and just do it. I was hoping to find out, obviously, as you can appreciate, yes, your your successful or no, the scope of the project's been reduced or you're just not successful, then we'll move on. Well, it's too big of a chunk of change to. And I get that, but another year with that the, the way it is right now, even up to the VIC, um, I'd just like for us to put a timeline on when we're going to ask the contractor to start because. If it's going to be in the middle of July, it's probably going to be a very tricky project to, to get a handle on over there. And if we're looking that we're waiting and waiting, we get to September, we through a whole another year of, uh, you know, that first perception of our community when they drive in. I know it's tough. I know what you're waiting for. And I know there's a there's extra money that could be there. And I know that Councillor Warwawa will keep uh, hounding uh, transportation. Or is it infrastructure? Uh, who, who's the grant through? I believe infrastructure. Okay. But I think <laughs> that on Monday, if things are not, if we hear nothing by Monday, I think that we, we're going to have to make, uh, make a decision because I don't know where the contractor's at right now with uh, what he has out in front of this. I mean, if we could get a time from the contractor, if he says, well, it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to go till July 1, even with the first part of the project, then we better book it. Because if the plan is to wait till September, I don't know that, that I would agree with that. I know there's money being left on the table, but I just don't like the, the way that the appearance is down there at all. And I don't know what everybody else on council thinks, but you guys want to have a discussion about this on Monday? Okay. Councilor Warwa, when does the house shut for the summer? Um, theoretically, it could go until the 23rd, just depending. They're in basically midnight sittings um, all this week. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a long couple of weeks, but it could be the 23rd. Okay. Okay. Um, Sandra, let's put uh, together a letter for the minister and letting them know how important this is to us, uh, the decision, and uh, we'll get it out tomorrow. Okay. Uh, thank you, Director Lefebvre. 
Uh, next up, Bryce. Okay, well, I, I got to call you interim director. Uh, what's the new term going to be? I mean, because. Interim director. <laughs> new guy. <laughs> new guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let's hear what you got on your plate. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. So, um, Megan was actually the one who drafted this, so I did it in the third person. But um, administration has implemented council's resolution to no longer accept credit card payment for payment of property taxes apart from using the option pay on the website. There has been a significant education piece to this, but overall most citizens have been accepting of the new parameters. Um, we continue to transition and train Bryce Johnston, the Interim Corporate <laughs> Services Director. In the past week, we have met with BMO, Alberta Municipalities, and China Tech representatives to facilitate this transition. The signing authority's paperwork has also been completed and submitted to BMO, granting the Legislative Manager Signing Authority. And I've just been getting cross-trained and been part of the senior management meetings and tours of the town facilities in the past week, which was great to see and allowed me to kind of see the infrastructure that exists in application that now you can link back to all the capital asset listings, so. The billing code. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that building looks like. Excellent, any questions? So, uh, Monday will we be seeing a financial statement or a cash statement? We definitely can. What would you like to see? Well, one with a lot more zeros, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> 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 Usually at council meetings, we have a, uh, uh, an update of uh, what money went out and what money sales department, sorry, director of the, the phase department was spending. We'll definitely prepare one. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. And now we're looking uh, for the CAO highlights. Thank you, Your Worship. Follow me on this one. Uh, so, uh, yeah, in front of you, uh, three documents here to just briefly discuss. Uh, first one being the uh, action item uh, list. And so on table, you have an updated uh, June version. Um, so I, I rolled the spreadsheet over and uh, took away a little over a half a dozen items. Uh, from the previous May one. Uh, good news is obviously number 40 there, as uh, Councillor Lemko had mentioned, the BMX uh, pump track uh, is now complete. Uh, we've got the um, sort of use at your own risk signage going up here this week, if not already in today, and that was my, my final step. My discussion point on here was to have a, a chat with you guys about what we might want to do for a little bit of a of a grand opening, you know, picture type thing there early next week. Um, well, I think we could all get our BMX bikes down could. there. <laughs> on top of that hill. What's <laughs> Chicken's Choice? Good. So, uh, yeah, so we'd like to do something, sp uh, definitely a photo op as a, as a minimum, maybe with all the members of council, uh, the, you know, the staff involved, and then... Uh, maybe you know, we could invite... Uh, maybe uh, a couple of classes from each school and, and uh, invite them over for the afternoon for a, a picture taking on some bikes some students before school uh, school closes maybe we can get uh, some popsicles or something like that good i guess sandra will just see what's left in the budget but good i'll uh, we'll make a few calls and see what we can do there haley you bring your kids it'll be fine <laughs> yeah oh, really? mine, mine have been there half a dozen times already too <laughs> Helmet. <laughs> Start them young. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I'd like to see a bit of an opening there, and uh, yeah. there'll be a process to thank uh, Colville Construction or something. That'll be yeah, for sure. They they gave us a phenomenal deal on that work, sure, and yeah. uh, so we're we're super happy with that for sure. Definitely want to thank them for that project. Um, yeah, moving uh, moving on, and just a couple of other uh, items on this uh, this particular sheet that we've noted off as complete. And then uh, the rest are all definitely underway. Uh, still that one, Investigate Ice Longer, um, one that we haven't put pen to paper on yet. So that's the only one. Probably hard to get a little dangling. feedback on that today. Everybody <laughs> is not thinking about uh, the arena today. <laughs> I do have questions about 67. Okay. When are we going to get a strong confirmed date? Oh, good. Uh, yeah, last conversation I had with the contractor on that, I believe was either last week or the week before, and they said... 
the signs are being built as we speak, so I can follow up with them and see if they've got an ETA for uh, putting holes in the ground and, and getting going. All the approvals are in place. It's it's ready to go. We just got to wait for the construction to actually finish, so I'll, I'll circle back with them. You've heard that thing about the squeaky wheel, right? It, uh, <laughs> it works. Okay, <laughs> we'll do. Sorry, it would be nice to have it before the... Cinta Festival and all of the summer events. We, I, we I won't make it for Father's Day, I'm sure, but nope. we've got a lot of people no. that will be coming to Niagara. It would be nice to be able to have that. I had mentioned in that last conversation that uh, shooting for pre-Canada Day is a minimum, so assuming they'll need two, three days to install the signs, I would imagine they're, they're both a pretty significant undertaking, so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll find out. Um... And not on the action item sheet is our um, housing needs assessment. So I did have a, a quick email exchange with that contractor uh, there today. Uh, I've got a meeting lined up with them for Friday. Uh, they're, they've put pen to paper and they just want to go over the, the final draft with me before they're prepared to present it. So uh, that project's nearing completion as well. A any questions on the action items right now? Anybody else? No. Good. Councilor Bora? Where are you? Okay. You're good? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so next one, there's the uh, capital and special projects list. So as you guys will note, a uh, lot more green and yellowish orange uh, since last time. I did uh, crunch the statistics on this and we're at just under 70% um, actioned and or complete here so far this year. Uh, so good uptake, um, you know, and a lot of the big important stuff is, is underway. Um, any, if you guys have any questions on those, we can entertain them at this time. Anybody? So Just to let you know too, there are a few on there that are sort of the study type projects too, right? We're going to leave those till after the construction season, so don't necessarily look for everything to be yeah. completed by September kind of thing, folks. There's there's stuff that we'll leave dangling till the end just to make sure we fit it all in. So the 29. <coughs> yes. Now, when we first talked about this, there was jackhammering and tiles and everything. Did we look at just putting a surface screen over top of we it. did yeah and we discussed that with the uh, manager of facilities there on our tour last week and he's got a uh, a process in place to basically just put y like you're saying Smaller a, screen. a screen almost like a spaghetti strainer yeah. kind of thing over top of it for now just to, to patch it up and make it i would imagine how he would like it to be stainless and a bunch of stuff like that yeah okay yeah so uh, and that's yeah okay anybody any ad other questions on this Okay, thank you. Good. And then last but not least, uh, foundational documents. Um, no really firm update there other than to say, yeah, as uh, we saw Human Resources presenting today, we're plugging away at, uh, at a few of those policies. And um, yeah, looking good for, for so far this year. Okay, so I do have a, a couple of questions that I, I should have brought up earlier. On the, first of all, on the purchase of the new garbage truck, which we ordered, I'm pretty sure it's two years now. Yes, the, the truck from when it was ordered till we're hopefully going to receive it, which is October of this year, will be two years. So October, we're, we're expecting it to be delivered. We are hopeful. Okay. And did on the new uh, pumper on the for the fire department has that truck been ordered? Or are we still looking into the specs? Or go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. There was a uh, contingent of staff that went down to a trade show there uh, last week or the week before um, that were sort of looking at various specs and stuff like that, gathering information for what we what we might need. Uh, so the final plan's being put into place. I would imagine the pricing has gone down a bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So there was another piece of correspondence that I didn't see here from MCS Net. That was you and me, right? Yep. 
Yeah, so uh, I have that in my email, Your Worship. We'll probably, we'll probably reach out. They were asking for uh, the opportunity to present their soul shoot for the 12th or, or so if, uh, if we get it. Right. Um, that uh, email was forwarded on to me. We'll be contacting them uh, tomorrow to have them come present directly to council. Hopefully we're shooting for the 20th of June so they can make their presentation direct to all of you. What's going on the 20th of June? It's just the next ledge meeting. I thought we only had one in June. No, July and August we only have oh, one. Oh, okay. Okay, I stand corrected. Yeah, sorry. I said, I said the 12th. Well. So yeah, that uh, contact's been made. We're lining it up. Good, yep. excellent. Um, is there any other questions for CAO Leggett? Seeing none, thank you. So the Duke of Edinburgh Global, Global Leaders Delegation is here on Thursday. I don't know if you've all s had a chance to see. They split the delegation up. Half are going to Calgary and the other half are coming to here. But uh, there's... Um, of course, Jameson has arranged all this, and he'll be leaving, leaving us all by ourselves, which is nice, so whatever. <laughs> anyway, Jameson, uh, I've been watching the emails. It looks like everything is lined up other than permission to film uh, some of these people for that documentary. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, Your Worship. And in my defense, the holidays were booked prior to the finding out of this uh, delegation arriving in Vegreville. Uh, but... With that being said, uh, yeah, it would be a uh, meeting at the uh, Pesica. Uh, we've uh, worked with uh, internally here with Sandra and, and, and Lane to ensure that uh, there is going to be a bit of flair when the delegates arrive on site, a quick photo op, and then off to uh, Inotech, and from there they'll be uh, whisked away to the uh, Ukrainian village. Big, big thank you to the Ukrainian village for being so accommodating as well. Uh, we were able to get them an after-hours guided tour because uh, the chances of them making from Inotech to the village before they close their gates uh, didn't look so good. So they've been very accommodating, as has Inotech. Uh, to speak to the approval of, uh, of filming, these are two unrelated incidents uh, or unrelated, I guess, uh, you know, good news scenarios. Uh, there's also a mini documentary being filmed in Vegreville on June 8th. Uh, it, it just so happens to coincide with the arrival of the delegation. So we're trying to see if we can't marry the two together and to see if the delegation's okay with being on camera as uh, I think it only speaks to the importance of the egg uh, almost 50 years later that uh, people from all over the world quite literally come to see it. So uh, the hope would be that it all comes together, uh, but if not, it's, uh, it's two separate incidences, but still very, very good news for Vegreville that we're in the spotlight in, in many ways. So uh, uh, regarding the footage for the documentary, uh, there'll be an interview. Is there any other requests he asks of town? We uh, have dialogued uh, with this individual, and uh, the documentary is actually focused on a couple of different things, but primarily the Pesica. Uh, it's also uh, tied into the 50th anniversary of the Pesica Festival. So uh, I directed uh, this inquiry to the Vegreville and District Chamber of Commerce to uh, ensure that uh, they had representation or at least the opportunity to, to help arrange some interviews. And I believe that they have with a couple of the original pioneers of, of this project. Um, uh, Mr. Miller come to mind, as does Mr. Wild, I believe will be featured in the documentary. Uh, in terms of specific requests of the town, no. We just helped kind of tie everybody together. And then obviously uh, yourself talking about, uh, again, nearly 50 years later, the, the still very relevant Pesica and uh, what it means to, to visitors, seeing as we tracked 80,000 at the egg last year. Okay, and uh, when we get to uh, Alberta Inotech, uh, Lane will be in charge of, like, we're bringing the refreshments or whatever. Uh, Lane has uh, been instructed, and uh, I have every faith in her, that she will pre-order the refreshments tomorrow. She will uh, arrange with Inotech to have them dropped off prior to the photo op at the egg, and then we'll meet at the photo op so that everything is set up, ready to go from photo op back at Inotech for refreshments. How do you see the uh, Inotech experience? They're coming in, they'll have a cup of coffee, a bottle of water, a donut, and then... Well, I mean, we're speaking with, like, will Steve McMahon be there or? 
From what I've been told, Steve is expected to be there, um, uh, as well as a gentleman by the name of Hart Goldbreck. Um, Jan Slasky has also been CC'd in a lot of correspondence, but I haven't heard directly from him. So um, I'm, I'm hoping Steve will be there. Uh, I know that in the conversations that we've had uh, through email, there was a lot of uh, excitement about an opportunity to to welcome these delegates. Uh, we're talking people from Nigeria and India and Australia and Jamaica and uh, all of them kind of on one bus and then eventually I into one room. So I, I can't speak for certain as to uh, who will be representing Inotech, but uh, there was certainly a lot of excitement. In terms of the refreshments, I, I don't know what's more iconically Canadian than, of course, Tim Hortons coffee and donuts and uh, a cruller and a double-double. Uh, but coffee will be there, water, uh, the, 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 the whole accoutrement. I, I guess more than anything, Jamie, whose agenda is it when we get to Inotech? I, is that is on us or on it's on it's on Inotech at that point. I mean, there, I would hope and certainly expect you to offer a few few words uh, as this would be your chance to kind of formally address the delegation because it's going to be off the bus, photo op, back on the bus. Uh, as well, uh, Mr. Bisbalco with Alberta Hub will be there. He'll speak very briefly about the regional collaboration. At that point, Inotech takes over for the tour. Okay. Thank you and. Is council invited to this event or wh where are we going? They're certainly uh, invited. I sent out a calendar invite for the photo op uh, as well. If they'd like to join uh, on the tour for, for, uh, for InnoTech, feel absolutely free. Um, but uh, yeah, the calendar invite was sent out and then I believe I sent out a list of all of the delegates in terms of what I know and who will be here just a few days ago with an updated itinerary. So you should all have that in your emails. Okay, well, so thank you. Looks like you get everything covered. Perfect. Uh, the musical ride, the RCMP musical ride, is here on the 16th. Uh, who's all going to Alberta Muni's uh, in St. Paul on June 21st? <laughs> I, I know I'm signed up for it. There's another one in Spruce Grove on the 22nd, but St. Paul's, it's their summer meeting. Anytime we register council, we register you with your town of Vegarville email. So um, any events should be going directly to you. But if you're not getting them, please let me know and I'll make sure that they hit the agendas so you are aware of them. So if anybody wants to go, let me know which one, St. Paul or um, Spruce Grove, and I will have you registered this week. Okay, so that being said, uh, is there any other business of council? We have a delegation coming in five minutes for a closed session, so I'll take a motion to go into closed session. Councilor Berry makes the motion. All those in favor? Carry. At 423, Sandberg.